Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to take two of the Masterclass episode 67. That's right, episode one. Nope, not episode one. <laughs> take two. Take one of this very episode was thwarted by the demons of technology mid uh very, very never to be repeated intelligent revelation by myself. Uh my computer just shut down and rebooted. I was looking at, at my screen, GarageBand was chugging along, and then and my Mac restarted. So we are going to try and uh, start episode 67 over again in three, two. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Good, how are you? Fancy seeing you here, sir. Yeah. I mean, why, why would you be in your own basement? <laughs> Uh, but anyways, this is episode 67. We're here. Um, we're very excited, if not slightly annoyed, but we're going to make it work. And uh, we do have a main topic, but is there anything, Dave, that you want to say before we <laughs> get into our main topic? Uh, yeah. <laughs> or shall that remain between me and you forever? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Just doesn't feel the same the second time. I know, right? <laughs> There's jokes in there. I'm not going to make them though. <laughs> oh boy! Shall I summarize? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just here's here's what me and Dave have have. This is the very boiled down version of of what we said before. My silly computer ripped it from our hands. There is something to be said. And I think something very um, critical to being human is that we have to be willing to understand people that disagree with us. Mm -hmm. Whether that's something as trivial as sports alliances or far more important, such as the political uh, direction of a country that has consequences on the economy and national security and relations with other countries around the world, all of that stuff. Um, and and uh, we have seen in recent days, weeks, and months that there are plenty of people that choose not to understand or even attempt to understand folks with differing points of view. And um, Dave and I both believe that as Christians, it is... Um, it is of utmost importance for us to try and be the compassionate and um, understanding person who wants to know and wants to try to understand the viewpoints of others, be it political, religious, socioeconomic, um, national you know some people don't like us just because we're americans not because they know us but just because of what our country represents um did i did i do that any justice i feel like you want to add a few things <laughs> no I, it, uh yeah it, it well first of all it, it is a little disappointing because it felt like we had really had a good start to the i i'm so mad <laughs> I'm so mad so there's, <laughs> Um, no, I don't, I don't know that I have a lot to add. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it... it's not our night, man. Is that going to pick that up? Who knows? <laughs> Something's happening in the background. It's making a noise. We're just going to ignore it. You should too. <laughs> but I think it's the, uh, sump pump. Oh no. Listeners don't care about this. Let's move on. Um, no, but just there is enough. There is enough artificial division among people to begin with. What city you're born in, what side of the tracks you're born in, what color your skin is, uh, what sorts of clothes you wear, how much money your parents make, how much money you make as an adult, what kind of car you drive. All, of, all we we establish all these artificial. Um, 
dividers and definitions of people that if, oh, if you were black in middle school, you're a goth kid. Is, are, are goth kids still a thing? I have no idea. They were when I was in middle school. But, like, you're a jock or you're a nerd. or like we, we try to classify and we try to segregate and break down into these little cliques where we can go, ooh, yes, you're like me. We're the same. We're the right kind because we do things the right way because that's how we like them. And I, I think this has been exacerbated by the fact that if you are a um, – oh, gosh, how do I want to go here? If if you are a minority kid uh, that is underprivileged and it's clear where you go to school that, that you are one of the few of your ethnicity, of your socioeconomic class, of your interest, uh, you know, 25 years ago you would have to deal with that. You'd have to deal with and learn how to live amongst people that thought poorly of you, thought differently than you, wanted to put you down. Um, whereas nowadays, yes, you still have to live with that, but you now, by by way of the internet and social media and and all that stuff, you can go find people all over the world in the click of a button that think and look and feel and act and enjoy the same things you do. And you can build this buffer around yourself where you don't have to deal with the, you don't have to deal with as much the negative effects. Certainly the negative effects of life um, affect everybody. But I think that, oh man, this I'm going to sound like such a moron when I go back and listen to this. I need to I need to collect my thoughts on this for maybe another episode because I want to say things that I know that I'm going to regret. So, I'm going to pull the plug on this right now. <laughs> but no, because because I want to I want to communicate compassion for people, but I also want to c- communicate get over it and work with people that you disagree with. And I don't quite know how to bridge that gap tonight without sounding like a jerk. And there's a better way to do this than sounding like a jerk. Especially because I'm annoyed that we're, we lost our audio. But all, all, all I will say tonight before maybe I write this and get my thoughts out is that I personally... And I and I don't want to put words in Dave's mouth, so I'm not gonna. I personally think that people who are unwilling to at least listen to somebody from the other side, and that might even be someone who's moderate and who isn't conservative and who isn't liberal, but if someone is kind of sees pros and cons on both sides, right? If you're not willing willing to listen to somebody else's point of view at all, what's wrong with you? Why Why not? Why won't you listen to him? Did Jesus listen to other people's point of view? He hung out with hookers and tax collectors, and he listened to the, to the Pharisees all the time. He, he pushed back against them, but he still listened to them and understood what they were trying to do. Yeah, very much so. And he listened to Pontius Pilate accuse him of all the stuff when he was about to be crucified. So there, Dave. You just got Jesus. <laughs> now you're going to tell me I'm wrong and I'm going to feel like a dummy. No, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I just, there's, so what Jesus represented, right? Son of God, perfection, without sin, grace, mercy, forgiveness, standing up for the truth, right? Spent a majority of his time with people that wanted nothing to do with any of that. Mm-hmm. In fact, a lot of the people he hung out with engaged in activities that were directly against those things. And so if Christ can come to earth as the Son of God and spend his time with the people that are living in direct opposition to what he stands for, why can we not just listen to somebody who sees things a little bit differently than we do? Just a little bit differently. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Oh, there's all kinds of strange noises going on tonight. Uh, 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think the thing that I would come back to time and again is that, um, I definitely think Jesus loved everybody. And even when he didn't agree with people, he still loved them. And his, any time that he, um, was in opposition to somebody, it was about God being glorified. And I know for me personally, and I would venture to say a lot of us that we make it about ourselves and we don't make it about God. Absolutely. And so, um, not easier said than done, obviously. Um, but I just, I, I, it never ceases to amaze me how quickly people can think that they are right about what they believe and what they defend and hold so dearly. When you take just about any position that there is, and again, I'll speak for myself. There are people a lot smarter than I am, have much greater wisdom than I do, who've lived longer, experienced more, that have opinions different than my own. And why I would simply believe that that you're right and yeah. I'm right and they're wrong. How messed up is that? I don't know. <laughs> it seems to be human nature, but I know, but like. E- as you're saying this, it's reminding me of of just the thoughts I've been having recently of why is my default I'm right, you're wrong? Yeah. Like why is that my default stance? Now I like to think that I'm at least good at listening to other people's thoughts. I may not I may not like try and understand them like I just told everyone else to. Shh. Um <laughs> but my my default is I'm right, you're wrong. You talk, and then let me prove to you why you're wrong and I'm right. And that is so unhealthy. And so you know, I just it makes me upset that I am that way. Because mm-hmm. I don't want to be that way. And, and there are moments where I am that way, and then I realize it later, and I feel like a total idiot. And there's moments where I'm like genuinely interested in, why do you think that? And then you really have to question, like, oh, have I even ever considered that? But I just... Why is it our default that, at least for me, I'm right, you're wrong, let's start from there. Like, I am not my ideas, I am not my opinions, I am not my thoughts, yet when it comes to those things, I grasp onto them as if they are what I am. Mm -hmm. And maybe that says more about, you know, where I'm at with God right now than, than, you know... I wish to <laughs> tell strangers, but it just bothers me, you know? Well, and I think it's true for most than it, than it not being true for most. I think that's where we all probably land. And if you think about the people that you've encountered and that are truly some of the more interesting people that you've probably spent time with, um, those are people that are really good at uh, that are good at asking questions, and in my time here on Earth, personally, I, I've I've come to the conclusion. One of the beliefs that I hold is that one of the most effective communication skills uh, that you can have, that you can develop, is to learn to ask good questions, and then actually listen when somebody gives you an answer. Uh, to your question uh, because you learn by asking questions and um, you can get a lot of information by just simply asking questions and uh, it comes quite naturally to us when we're small you know uh, particularly why 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 we'll ask why a lot Uh, my oldest daughter asked what's that and it just seems like it's one of those things that's kind of um, developed out of us is that, you know, don't ask questions. Don't, don't, don't get personal. Don't be rude. Don't. Parents are the worst, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I think we have a natural curiosity that we um, 
squeeze out of us. And that uh, as time goes by, if you want to be an interesting person, then be interested in others. And the way you show you're interested in others is by asking questions. And I'll be the first to admit, I can be at the end of my rope, my end of my rope, end of my, uh, end of my, I don't know what I'm looking for there. Um, tolerance for others. <laughs> Uh, and I don't want to ask questions. I don't want to be interested in other people. And I just want to be left alone. Um, but yeah, um, ask questions. Uh, put yourself out there as to uh, why other people believe what they believe, um, what they think, who they are, where they're from, what they've done, who they've loved, where they've lived. Um, and then listen, because everybody's really interesting. I've, I've kind Every, of, everybody. I, I, I used to think that there weren't, everybody's interesting on some level. Everybody's got something about them that they can, uh, is worth hearing about. So, and, and, and the, and the other thing is I will say about that is, is, um, everybody's got something interesting. They're just not always good at it, at sharing <laughs> what is interesting about them. So that's fair. And, and the other thing I will tell you is there are such things as stupid questions. <laughs> That whole fallacy of there are no stupid questions. Yeah, there are stupid questions. But thankfully, generally, people, other people have the same stupid question. Well, I, I feel like the there is no stupid questions is the adults trying to undo the damage they've done by saying, stop asking questions. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Why? Why? Because I said so. Oh, but there's no stupid questions, honey. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Boy. Well... We haven't lost the recording yet, so I feel like perhaps we should dive Go ahead into and move our forward. main topic before, you know, something else goes wrong. I'm, like, really concerned we're going to get, like, a phone call. <laughs> 911, quick, come to the hospital. It's just been one of those. <laughs> I feel like I might have just over overreacted there, but I don't know. Sorry, guys and ladies. I'm... Matthew. Matthew. 19. 16 through 30. Oh, that's a lot of verses. There's a lot of verses. But there's a lot of Jesus in them, so we should, we should take our time. All right. Would you like me to read? Dave, I would love for you to read. All right. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go. Sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we, will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you will have followed me. You who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or land for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Well done. Yeah. That was a, uh, that was a long one. It was a long one. I had, a, I had enough time to post a Snapchat video of you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was wondering what you were doing over there. Yes, Dave preaching the gospel on Snapchat. Mm. With a with a cool ver- cartoon version of me with a megaphone going, yeah. <laughs> Pretty proud of it. I, I do was, not have Snapchat. I'll have to get 
Yeah, I totally derailed us there. I'm so sorry. You were talking about Jesus, and I brought up Snapchat. Dave, I need help. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right, so first question. <clears throat> I'm just going to dive right back in. Why does the rich young man believe that he can do a deed in return for eternal life? Like, if you think of it in that concept, he walks up to Jesus. What deed can I do to earn eternal life? Like, what is the one thing that must occur that I can accomplish by myself because I'm a rich young man? Seems a bit ridiculous. Uh, I don't think he was looking for a good deed that he must do to have eternal life. Uh, I think this was a, I'm going to come to Jesus and I'm going to ask what good deed do I have to do? And he's going to tell me what I have to do. And I'm going to say, I've done that. And so I, I think there was very much this sort of, um, you know, even what Jesus tells them, don't murder, commit adultery, love your neighbors yourself. You know, I, I think for this this young man, he was coming to Jesus to go, look what I've done. Because uh, he was expecting Jesus to say something that would allow him to go, well, I've done that, so I'm good. I get to go to heaven. Yes, all of you in the crowd, look at me, pat my back. <laughs> Here's a shilling for you. So yeah, I, I don't think he was looking for a single good deed. I think he was looking for... <laughs> For Jesus to say something that he could say, well, I've done that. So so much like the Pharisees, he's trying to set Jesus up. Maybe uh, not, maybe uh, not yeah. in like a trap, but right. in a, ha, gotcha, I've done that. Yeah. Look at me type of. So he's, he's, not, he's not being straightforward with Jesus, is what you're saying. I, I don't believe he is. I, I, I think there's very much a... Um, you know, Jesus would have had some sense of who this person was, whether he actually knew him by name or not. Um, I think by his his affluence, um, he would have been, you know, in the fact that he's, you know, it, well, I, so I, th- in short, I think Jesus is good at reading people. He saw this guy. I think he kind of knew who he was getting with him, uh, and and even sort of lends it to the whole. Uh, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. You know, there's there's kind of even Jesus doing that whole, you call me good, um, kind of that double meaning again of, uh, the only one who is good is God. Why do you call me good? Are you, you know, um, yeah, so... I I do enjoy the rich young guy's response. Keep the commandments. Which ones? <laughs> As if the commandments wasn't specific yeah. enough. I don't know. Um, but of course, Jesus indulges him, rattles off, you know, a few. What do I still lack? See, he doesn't just... I really feel, now that you've kind of framed it that way, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? Like, come on, Give me more lists I can check off. I want to look really good, you mm-hmm. know, as opposed to just taking it and going, all right, cool, see you later. And then Jesus kind of, you know, drops the bombshell on him. Well, if he would be perfect, go sell what you possess, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for <laughs> he had great possessions. <laughs> You could just like see his like his chest his chest puffing up, and then like a little blue animal just oh, and then just oh. walking away with his tail <laughs> between his legs. Yes, that's what Jesus is about, kids. Shaming you in public. <laughs> I was very sarcastic there, people. <laughs> I'm not being serious, um, but I do think that there is a that. <sighs> The words of Jesus are are very sobering, and this is a prime example of that, where this, you know, young guy is very um, pleased with himself and what he's accomplished and how good of a life that he's led, and he approaches Jesus to, you know, potentially get some congratulations for being so wonderful, and when Jesus really reveals to him what uh, living in his kingdom is like, he does so at, you know, um, a bit of a um, harsh way, 
but it cuts directly to the heart of this guy, and he walks. Away. He winds up walking away from it because he doesn't want to mm-hmm. give up what he's worked so hard to achieve. Mm-hmm. And that is, I think, one of the most interesting interesting things about um, Jesus to me is that he is not afraid to say choose this or choose me. Mhm. Yeah. And he's he is not afraid to put you up to the choice. This is what you really love. I'm what you should love. Pick. Right. Leave what you really love for what you should love or stay where you're at. And I don't think that sort of um Polarity is very popular in today's Christianity. I don't think it's ever been popular. Well, that's probably why they killed him. <laughs> uh, I, and specifically, I I um, was listening to um, an audio book, um, and I can't even think of what it's what it's called, but basically the, the, the book is um, Writings of Martin Luther. And in the Writings of Martin Luther, there were also, it includes this 95, 95 thesis statements. 95, is that right? Statements, theses? 95 theses, 90, yeah. 95 theses uh, that <laughs> he supposedly nailed to the door. Um, but to be quite candid, I've had I don't know that I'd ever heard those ninety five things, uh, ever before listening to this audiobook. It's a good point. In the last week, like literally, I could have not told you what they were about, and even as I'm speaking now, I I still don't totally know. I but one of the things that stood out to me was this sense of, you know, in He's very direct. He talks about the Pope, and he talks about the Catholic Church. And that is not my point here with all of this, because I think part of my revelation with the 95 Theses was was that I was like, oh, gosh, I can't believe that that was even going on, where essentially people were paying for dead relatives to get into heaven. Oh, yeah. And and, and, and things like that, you know. Totally that, messed up. That I don't think anybody would. Where like, do you think televangelists got the idea from? <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, you know, some of his points are like, wow, this is really screwed up. And and ultimately, well, not ultimately, one of the points that he, that was made to me in listening to Luther was this idea of God doesn't force people's hands. Like, even if you pay for this person to be this, God doesn't, you know, he doesn't want that. He wants what you were saying, the, the, the choice, the decision. He wants for that individual person to choose them. As, as, as bad and as wrong as paying for things, such as getting somebody out of purgatory really is, Ultimately, he's like, think of the absurdity of that yeah. in that that's not how God operates. He wants the choice of that person because, you know, that's ultimately what it boils down to. And uh, I'm grateful for people like Martin Luther because I don't think that the... um again, just the, some of the things that are mentioned in the 95, I just was like, I can't believe that that was even a thing. I can't believe he even had to say that. But I think it's because he did say it that I get to now live out my faith under a different umbrella of of what the church is and um, even what the Catholic church is today is not as <laughs> probably corrupt as it was. Not that it's corrupt, but just... It, it, it really truly was at a low point, I think, when much of that was going on one of the lower points in the Catholic church's history. Anyway, long story short, God wants us to choose him versus anything else. Yeah. And so I think it's always been true. Jesus's day, Martin Luther's day, our day. Yeah, that's, you know, when you put it that way, choose God or choose anything else. 
it's it really is no wonder that people are kind of like, okay, I choose everything else. Yeah. You know? Um like it's it it's not that surprising because everything else has a lot of appeal to it. And you know, certainly if if you know, you believe what the Bible says is true and it turns out that it, you know, is true when when the end happens, you know, which I believe is the case, then then following God has a lot of appeal, but following God has a lot of appeal for eternity. Mm-hmm. Doesn't necessarily have a lot of appeal for right now. In the sense of what have you done for me lately? You know? The whole instant gratification thing. Like following God is storing up treasures in heaven. I can't see those treasures in heaven. I can't see heaven. I don't know what heaven's gonna be like, other than I'm not gonna be a jerk when I'm there. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> and then there's even I think even for the strongest believer, there's somewhat of a I can't know 100% sure that that's true. I mean, that's ultimately what faith is about. Um, is that there's not very scientific, Dave. Nope, I'm not very scientific. That's a whole other topic I've been listening on. That <laughs> Oh, the idea that we can know everything? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, no, that every... That, um, I, I've started studying some stuff in terms of uh, creation story mm-hmm. and just physics and all that kind of stuff. And the assert, the absurdity of it being an accident or not an accident, but not a God. Um, if you apply science to the creation of the world and leave com- God completely out of it, science doesn't really support it at all. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's really interesting. So whatever, man, stuff comes from nothing all the time. It's yeah. totally normal. <laughs> Happens and again, every I, third Tuesday. And I'm not a very scientific person, but as you start listening to it, you're like, wow, the laws of physics, the laws of, you know. Yeah. And I love that they call them laws. Mm, interesting. But there's no higher authority to make them laws other than that they just occur regularly. Mm. But the law of gravity has changed. No, the law of gravity hasn't changed. Our understanding of the law of gravity mm-hmm. has changed. And that, like, I have received that rebuttal from a few people in my life that are not Christians and are uh, very much science-oriented people. And God bless them. We need those people, for sure, because me and Dave are not those people. <laughs> <laughs> we need people that are are great chemists and biologists and um, f- physicists and, and astrophysicists, and we need people to do the work that they're doing. But when the rebuttal of what well, the the laws of science have changed as like a rebuttal against God making it cuz you know no 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 our understanding of those things has changed. Those things have not changed. Mm-hmm. They haven't. No. The earth is the earth. And our understanding of the earth and I'm going to say that because the Earth does have physical changes. Global warming is the thing, people. <laughs> the universe, let's go there, right? There are, there are parts of the universe that we're never going to see. Mm-hmm. But by us discovering new parts of the universe, does that mean the universe has changed? No, it just means that our understanding and knowledge of it has grown. And I just... I cannot get on board with the idea that we fully, completely understand everything. And I know there's a lot of scientists that would rebu- would rebuke what I just said. But the very notion of trying to attain that knowledge is absurd to me. Should we try and know a lot of things? To make life better? Absolutely. But the concept that me, we might someday, in an infinite time scale, if that's such a thing, learn everything, get over yourself. Yeah. Yeah, and kind of bringing it back to the faith thing. I, again, I'm not a scientist. I don't claim to be a scientist. I can understand enough to grasp the concept that to believe that matter was created out of nothing takes more faith because it goes against everything that science tells us 
than to believe that a God created it. Yeah, but you're missing the key point here, Dave. And I know you're not missing it, really. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say it that way. If there's no God, then there's no one to tell me how to live my life. Yes. If matter if matter came out of nothing, then there is no there is no higher power, there's no moral compass that we all we can all decide what our own moral compass is. We can all decide what we think is right or wrong. We can all choose for ourselves how we want to live our lives without repercussion. Oh, and that's very much the world we live in. Yeah. <laughs> Cuz it's easier. Yep. Cuz you can do what you want when you want to do it and you only have to answer to yourself. Unless you do something truly egregious. And then it's still subjective, it seems like. Yeah, it depends so. on it depends on the color of your skin, where where the egregious act took place, who it took place against, the circ like if you're an if you're an upper or upper middle class white dude, chances are you're probably not gonna unless you do something like crazy, crazy awful in public. You're probably gonna not be punished for it the same way as if you were a uh, you know, poor um male from a minority culture. It it's yeah. Here come the current events again, Dave. <laughs> um all right, so back to the uh the parable here. Or no, this isn't, this isn't even really a parable. This is just a story of something that happened. Although that does have parabolic tendencies. Uh, para, no, par, that's not the right word. Parabolic is a math. It's the curve. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Are we all supposed to sell our belongings and give them to the poor? If so, why? If not, why did Jesus tell this guy to do so? feel like maybe we have hinted at this answer already. Yeah, I, I, my answer is no. Oh, <gasps> but so, Jesus told him to do so, David. Um, well, and I think the, I think the very last sentence of this sort of sums that up. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And there's just that element of, um, uh, you know, it, there it is. He he's sad because he has to sell his possessions. Uh, whereas I think somebody that is truly uh, seeking after God and what what good deed must I do? Well, shoot, Jesus ends up asking his answering his question: What good deed must I do to have eternal life? Well, you want a good deed? Sell all your possessions and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven. Come follow me. Oh. If if I'm really looking for the good deed that I gotta do, that's pretty stinking simple. Yeah, you know, sell all my put stuff, put it all on eBay, <laughs> and, and it's and then I have treasures in heaven for all eternity. Wow, dang, I can do that. That's easy. And so I, I think this is a, a for this rich young man. It is is a condition of a heart, condition of his heart, and what he held uh, important to him. And as we've mentioned many times on this podcast. Um, Jesus is turning the world upside down. Uh, he is rearranging uh, the values of um, uh, his people. Um, so he's going from, you know, the Jewish nation, the Hebrew nation, and uh, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. And in Jewish culture, in Jesus' day when he was here on the earth, and I think you can see this throughout the Old Testament, is that um, generally people who go after God, they're blessed. They may have a, a time period in their life where uh, things don't go so well, but ultimately people that seek after God are blessed by material possessions, whether that be Job, whether that's Jacob, whether that's Joseph, whether it's David. You know, in the end, these poor people end up becoming rich because of their relationship with God. And so in Jesus' day, there's very much this element, this notion of um, if you are somebody that is a, if you are a godly person, uh, then you will also have um, earthly material uh, wealth as well. And um, sounds a lot like the prosperity gospel. 
Uh, I suppose it's possible. I, 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 I mean, I just, I guess I look at the Old Testament and there's very much a correlation between. And I, and I think that was the culture. Because, mm-hmm. well, because look at what the disciples say. Um, so Jesus tells his disciple, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. And then the camel go through the eye of a needle. Take that for whatever you want it to be. I've heard so many definition, different interpretations of that. But ultimately, however you interpret camel through the eye of the needle, the ultimate final place that you need to come at is clearly it's difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Um he compares that to a rich person entering the kingdom of heaven. So his disciples heard this and they were greatly astonished saying, who then can be saved? So there's this correlation of, well, if the rich can't be saved, then who can be saved? And I think it's just a concrete, tangible example of how people viewed um, somebody's godliness in comparison with their material possessions. This idea of you are blessed by God if you are a godly person and um so then there's even hope for us there of uh with man this is impossible so again the camel through the eye of the needle there's a sense of it's impossible but with god all things are possible and uh i guess there's even kind of we kind of get into the disciples now from here on out so my piece in this is just that um, all things are possible through God. I don't believe that he is asking everyone. He certainly calls some uh, to poverty or to give up all their worldly possessions. I think sacrificial giving um, is is important, and that's giving more than what we can, quote-unquote, afford to give in uh, trusting God when we do give to him that he's going to provide, and that there's this cultural shift going on that being wealthy does not equate being godly or being blessed by God. And that um, uh, if your possessions are that important to you, that might be the one thing that he asks you to give up. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the the crux of the matter here is that he didn't ask the rich guy to give up his Sunday afternoons to volunteer at the local homeless shelter, right? Mm-hmm. He asked the rich guy to give up his riches. And for some people, money is not the idol that it is for others. But there's something else that is. And that is what God is more concerned with, right? That choice of choose this or choose me. It's not always money for everyone. It's it's power. It's uh, your job. It's your standing in the community. It's the fact that you think you're a better parent than everyone else in your block. Like whatever it is, that thing that you hold on to is like, this is, this is, you know, what Mm -hmm. makes me happy. That's when God's like, choose that or choose me. You can't have them both. Um, but I also, uh, to, to go to the disciple section that you mentioned, Peter's response is see, we have left everything and followed you. Yeah. <laughs> what then will we have? Like that guy wah, wah, failed, wah. but we're still standing here. What do we get? <laughs> it's just typical Peter, just missing the point. Yes, bless his heart, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then Jesus says, uh, "Truly, I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, that sounds fun. Uh, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones." Judging the 12 tribes of Israel, we get into some apocalyptic stuff there. Uh, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last shall be first. There's a lot still to talk about, Dave. There is still a lot to talk about. Should we maybe do that next episode? Sure, so we'll pick up with... uh... We'll pick up with Peter's silly comment. We can certainly do that. And then finish this next episode because, well, it's late here (laughs) because we lost the first 25 minutes of this episode. Yes. All right.
Yes, thank you guys so much for listening. If you want to uh, share your thoughts, we genuinely would like to hear them. You can do so uh, on Twitter. Dave is at 10.8HBO, where 8 is the only number. I'm at Cam Brennan. Um, you can email us, hello at supermegacorp.net, and you can find the show notes at supermegacorp.net slash masterclass slash 67 because this is episode 67 and we'll be back barring you know the return of jesus we'll be back next week yeah bye see ya